why we are all here today. So thank you, Winston, for your uh, leadership. I am also obliged to thank uh, uh, our entire team at IFLA, Valencia, uh, 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 who is, is backstopping today, uh, uh, providing all the logistic support. Uh, but the entire team at IFLA, Despina, uh, uh, Esther, and others uh, who have helped us to uh, not only bring uh, uh, Pramila and myself to uh, APFSD, where we made a lot of interventions uh, at the round table yesterday. We sent a report uh, on all of our uh, interventions, uh, but uh, also ensured that uh, we are all in the same room. So thank you, colleagues of uh, Special thanks to Carly Backman, uh, who is the librarian of uh, uh, ESCAP uh, here. Kali is also joining us. Hello, Kali. Thank you so much for your uh, gesture. You provided us, uh, you opened your library for us uh, to, to be, uh, you know, to utilize your, your, your facilities uh, when uh, we were not look, be able to get a, a meeting room from, from a SCAP. Uh, you, you were able to provide, so thank you so much. And uh, special thanks to TAP, uh, who has uh, helped us to um, get all the arrangements here. Thank you. And with that note, what I would like to do, there is a, a kind of an order of uh, speaking order today. But uh, before that, I would like to give a, a kind of a background to this meeting as to why we are here, what we are supposed to be doing. And um, so I have a, a brief uh, note to share with you. Oftentimes, uh, you know, the title of the event is to be actually broken down because uh, usually we, we have this tendency to put a lot of words in the title. But at the end of the day, if we were to provide justice to the title of the event, we need to really understand what we are talking about. And uh, I've broken down this into three major uh, streams. First is very familiar to us, information societies at the foundation or as the foundation whatsoever way that we want to look at it. But uh, uh, that's, that's the background. But in the background, we also want to look at the context in which the information society is, uh, you know, uh, uh, being presented to all learners uh, who, are, who are part of it today, all citizens rather. And um, then once we uh, understand the context, uh, all the hard work is going to be done in terms of explaining how information societies serve as the foundation for a better post-COVID world is left to the five speakers who are going to come after me and the keynote uh, speech by Dr. Pramila Gamege. So that's the way that uh, we have organized uh, today's uh, discussion. And I don't want to give a lecture, but quickly run, you know, go through this uh, whole notion of information societies, which serves at the foundation or as the foundation it's emerging information society uh, from the third industrial revolution, which uh, was uh, uh, powered by ICTs, information communication technologies. We see uh, an emerging role and the characteristics accordingly change. And today, as we speak uh, in 2022, we are talking about an emerging informed, skilled world that would like to reap the benefits of the Industrial Revolution 4.0, uh, but also one that becomes green. That's why the Sustainable Development Goals become very, very dear to everyone, including the library society, the information society to which we belong to. Because uh, we, we know that uh, you know, we mean business, we, the, our business is not only providing processing information, but also ensuring that, that uh, knowledge and information passed on uh, uh, becomes uh, actionable, uh, particularly in terms of people's lives and livelihoods. So that's how we, we locate our information societies. And when it comes to pre-COVID world, uh, right from uh, uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan, uh, followed by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and uh, the current Secretary General, uh, since uh, the early 2000s, They've been uh, talking about the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which are now transformed into Sustainable Development Goals. And there are, uh, as you know, 17 goals and 116 targets, and many of which are uh, actually impacted uh, by the library community, particularly goal number four, five, eight, 17, and a few more. 
So in the pre-COVID world, we were all, the business was good as usual. But during the COVID, as you can see, the whole idea of uh, the sustainable world where planet, people, and uh, uh, profit and prosperity could all coexist um, was disrupted during the COVID times. And you can see the right-hand image where uh, almost all goals are not met. Ever since we started the Millennium Development Goals, we were hoping to get the midpoint uh, by 2022. Uh, with uh, only eight years to go to accomplish the SDGs, we are actually regressing in certain areas. As you can see, um, life below water, we are regressing, climate action, we are regressing, we are not progressing enough. Uh, the report card is uh, actually giving a, a glimpsy picture. And uh, that's where uh, we have a, a greater responsibility as librarians. And if we want to look at, uh, I am not going to, through all the targets and goals, but I want to simply point to one or two facts. If you look at goal number four, which is providing quality education, during the COVID times, uh, we had uh, almost 600 days of schools closed in many countries in Asia Pacific. And uh, India becoming one of those uh, countries where uh, uh, most number of uh, days the schools were closed. Bangladesh fully closed uh, almost 400, uh, three, 350 days during the COVID times. And uh, that has impacted inequality in education, achieving the education indicators. And uh, you know we are lagging behind, as you can see in the performance, where we should have been at the 100%. We are actually, whether it is uh, providing proficiency in mathematics and reading and writing and comprehension, we are all going back. And uh, libraries have a greater role to play. When it comes to uh, adults, education and skills, the labor force participation uh, is actually providing a glimpse of picture. You can see that uh, at the bottom of the screen uh, in the table left, uh, Singapore, Brunei, Australia, Japan are all doing well because uh, they are progressing from an agrarian to industrial to services-based society, whereas uh, many other countries uh, are uh, trying to strike a balance uh, where uh, the production in agrarian uh, uh, due to agrarian distress is very high. And when it comes to digital skills, which are required for uh, tomorrow's world, particularly among the youth, and Asia Pacific being one of those young population, we seem to have a very glimpse, glimpsy picture here, you know, very sad picture. We thought uh, Asia Pacific was up there uh, with all digital skills, but uh, the right-hand side uh, table shows that we have a long way to go in terms of using even a uh, uh, a basic spreadsheet, uh, let alone uh, ability to download and use a software. So spread of digital skills is uh, not good. When it comes to the goal number five, gender inequality, uh, in many uh, targets, we are lagging behind in Asia Pacific. When it comes to the uh, goal uh, partnership goal 17, you can see that uh, the commitment towards public private civil society partnership, uh, we are regressing. We are regressing uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, technical cooperation. The only place where we have progressed faster than we, would, we expected to was uh, personal remittances of uh, diaspora living in other countries, uh, sending money home, uh, you know, in terms of partnerships. Uh, and also the, uh, the area in which uh, foreign direct investments uh, that flew in, into least developed countries. But uh, even in terms of mobile internet, uh, mobile broadband and uh, fixed broadband, uh, many countries are not doing well. This is where libraries play a, a very significant role in providing community access, community skills, digital skills, uh, opening up uh, their op uh, facilities when the schools are in blended state. So there are quite a few services that uh, we have been providing, we can continue to provide, we have a, a bigger responsibility. This screen shows how the Los Angeles Public Library outside of Asia Pacific has uh, been thinking about uh, their contribution to the sustainable development goals. And also you have uh, uh, an example of how academic libraries uh, are providing support to um, uh, millennium development goals. So, but uh, this, these are all examples from uh, uh, the states. But today, um, as a segue to our uh, presentation by our esteemed colleagues, six of them um, emanating from uh, 
Dr. Pramila Gamege, who is going to speak on behalf of IFLA, uh, uh, followed by examples from the Philippines, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and Singapore, would uh, answer the first uh, uh, question that I had, which was how information societies become the foundation for a better post-COVID world. And there are examples that are within the library system. And uh, with this note, uh, I would like to actually move on and uh, encourage uh, our colleague, uh, Pramila, to come in. Um, yeah, so Pramila, you can unmute your, uh, your mic and I'll stop sharing my screen. So are you able to share your screen, Pramila? I still see yours. Okay, I've stopped sharing. So I invite uh, Pramila to unmute, please, and uh, speak for eight minutes. Uh, then uh, uh, we will go in an order. Thank you, Pramila. Okay, thank you. Can you all see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I will very briefly present you uh, IFLAS negotiations and engagements in developing 2030 agenda and how libraries contribute to the SDGs with an example from Sri Lanka. IFLA, as you all know, IFLA is the global, global voice of libraries and global voice for libraries. As part of global voice for libraries, IFLA engages with various international institutions and processes. IFLA is on the observer roster at UN Economic and Social Council, which allows for participation in meetings and events linked to the SDGs. IFLA has been actively involved in the creation of the UN Agenda 2030. Since 2012, it had extensive negotiations and advocated for the inclusion of access to information, safeguarding of cultural heritage, universal literacy, and access to information and communication technologies in the framework. In 2015, at the UN negotiating session on the post-2015 UN development framework, IFLA introduced Leon Declaration on Access to Information and Development. IFLA argued that access to information is a common principle as well as a cross-cutting issue across all the goals and targets. IFLA advocates for libraries to the recognized as essential partners of inclusive sustainable development through their work to provide meaningful access to information for all. The current action plan of our committee, that is IFLA Asia Oceania Regional Division Committee, encourages the library sector to support the SDGs, build the capacity of libraries to advocate for our values and goals at national and regional level, and also increase the resilience of the sector in facing economic pressure and climate events. As you all know, libraries play a vital role in improving outcomes across all SDGs. The goals highlight or mark with stars are the goals where strong library services and information system and freedom of access to information can make a difference. Economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable development depends on access to information. Libraries are essential for meaningful and equitable access to information focused on giving everyone the possibility and skills to make the most of information. 
there are plenty of references to the role of libraries in supporting local and regional initiatives around education. These include not simply counting libraries as part of the education infrastructure, but they are value for different age groups from preschool children to school age children, especially during COVID and to adults engaged in lifelong learning. And libraries also support gender equality by providing safe meeting spaces, programs for women and girls on their right and health, and ICT and literacy programs that support women to build their entrepreneurial skills. Kazakhstan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Thailand are just few examples for this. And also libraries provide global network, network of community-based institutions that are ready to support national development plans locally, regionally and a resource for improved decision making. Read about what libraries around the world are doing in support of the SDGs at IFLAM Library Map of the World and Asia and Oceania booklet. Here are a few examples. Let me share one example with you, how the libraries in Sri Lanka responded to COVID-19 and supported SDGs. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the National Library of Sri Lanka formed a partnership with Commonwealth of Learning Canada, Coursera Workforce Recovery Initiative, the, with the aim of helping job seekers in Sri Lanka to gain skills and reskill to enter into the job market, as well as reinforce job-related skills to regain employment. Coursera Initiative offered learners unlimited and free access to over 5,000 courses designed to skill and reskill them. The National Library also co collaborated jointly with diverse local organizations such as Vocational Training Authority, public libraries, educational institutions, especially that work with disabled people, telecom organizations for free data for learners and employers. At the end of the first phase, the program product produced more than 4,300 learners who earn 21,343 certificates from world-renowned universities and institutes. This include, includes blue economy, green economy, sustainable life, courses related to those subject areas. The program resulted in positive outcomes. It has helped unemployed to find jobs, secure jobs and improve livelihood. A wide range of courses that can tap requirements as well as the potential of learners have enabled the employed people to hone their skills for career advancement through promotions. Some of the skilled learners have set up small businesses, created avenues for self-employment to sustain their livelihood. Nearly half of the learners enrolled into the program were females. This means the Skills Online Sri Lanka program has also immensely contributed towards gender equality and thereby strengthened the female participation in the workforce. So 2021 has been a record year for references to libraries in the voluntary national relief that UN member states report on national progress towards the SDGs. Out of the 39 reports published in the review, 17 refer to libraries. These references covered not just education, but around 10 of the 17 SDGs. This is our opportunity to communicate to our national authorities how libraries serve as cost-effective partners for advancing their development priorities. So contribute to your stories, showcase the changes you made, promote the role of libraries as supporters of development. Thank you.
Thank you, Pramila. That's an excellent uh, wrap up of what uh, and how IFLA has been involved in the implementation of SDGs, but also in the larger scheme of things. But it's only a glimpse of what uh, IFLA does uh, uh, at the wider world. So if you want to uh, learn more about what IFLA does, uh, please get in touch with IFLA directly through the Asia Oceania Regional Office as well. And Mr. Winston Roberts is here and other office bearers are here. And uh, the examples that you highlighted, Pramila, are also replicated in uh, other countries, uh, particularly in Ghana, AFLIA, the African Federation for Library Associations and uh, Institutions, uh, have taken it at a large scale, uh, spreading it around 26 African countries. And we have seen this also happen in India, Bangladesh, and many other countries. So thank you so much for uh, highlighting that. Uh, and also I must mention that uh, as a result of Sri Lankan uh, experience, uh, the Commonwealth of Learning has extended this uh, partnership with Coursera for another three years so that uh, uh, people from all these countries can uh, gain micro-credentials, which are directly impactful in their employment opportunities. So our next speaker, we move on from uh, the IFLA and Sri Lanka example to the land of uh, the Philippines, where uh, our next colleague, uh, Ms. Elvira Lapuz, the university librarian of the University of uh, the Philippines, Diliman, is going to focus on library support strategies uh, to achieve uh, SDG 4 and 5, uh, is particularly by meeting the needs of women, girls, uh, through a rights-based approach, right, right, right to education, health, public services, business skills, and so on. Thank you, Ms. Lapus, for joining us. Please unmute yourself and uh, um, go ahead with your presentation. Okay, good, good afternoon, uh, Shadi, and good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to, to other parts of the world, or good, good evening to other parts also. Um, for goal four, uh, that ensures inclusive and equitable quality education. Libraries have been supporting these goals now. We already have dedicated staff who support early literacy and, and lifelong learning. And we've already been providing access to information and research for students. And the third is inclusive spaces where cost is not a barrier to gaining new knowledge and skills. And um, pre-pandemic, We've already been doing all this. Uh, there were libraries that has been, you know, um, whether they, 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 they wanted it or not, have stopped. But then again, uh, moving forward and looking forward to a better uh, post-COVID uh, scenario, we can continue doing this and we can, you know, continue providing for, for this, uh, for our students, for our, for our researchers. For everyone uh, would like to embark on uh, producing new knowledge, so the libraries will always be there. Okay. Um, for goal five, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Libraries have always been the safe and welcoming uh, meeting spaces. The goal really is to you know to, to do away with discrimination. Here in the Philippines. Um, one, uh, if, I, if I may make an example, um, one, one uh, indicator, you know, is uh, uh, access to jobs and job opportunities. You see, uh, men have the higher, you know, uh, possibility of getting a job, particularly now during this pandemic. The, the 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 numbers indicated um, from a from a survey that men have higher you know uh, uh, possibility or opportunity from getting a job. So what 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 women do is that those who are able to to work at all, okay, will is now burdened with you know uh, say this this mix work arrangements. This we are we, we kind of experience here. See, I'm pointing out that there's this um, not not this disconnect, but um, a lopsided, you know, uh, 
uh, type of opportunities. Men have better opportunities. But then when women are given uh, that, that, uh, that opportunity to work, okay, they're still expected you know, to do household chores. They're still expected to take care of children. And during the pandemic, take care of sick relatives. So these are these are uh, these are silent uh, pandemic for me, um, and women okay get to experience this during this pandemic. So how do we achieve that gender equality, and how can we empower all women and girls so as not to you know experience this 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 disparity or this discrimination? Like I said, no libraries will be there as safe and welcoming uh, meeting spaces. Libraries will be there to provide programs and service and services designed to meet the need of women and girls, like uh, reproductive uh, women's right, um, health rights, uh, access to information that helps women build, you know, business skills and participate in political undertakings. This is quite uh, an issue here now in in the country because uh, an election is upcoming. So we will try to, to, to educate more more women on, on their on their political uh, rights, on their uh, better skills, on understanding the political situation in the country. Um, there's there's uh, there's a big possibility here that uh, someone who has been you know you've gotten rid of in the past is coming back. So. Uh, voter empowerment and women empowerment is something that we uh, we need to 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 uh, really have a, a good discussion on. So basically, when we talk about libraries and goals four and five, goals four on education, goal five on on gender equality, the library will play a critical role in this. Critical because access to useful and uh, uh, can, an information that can be authenticated is critical when you have a library. So library there will play a critical role. Um, so with this, I would like to just, you know, uh, share something that I learned or I, something that I always say or when I, when I give uh, a sharing about uh, SDGs and why libraries are important. Um, I got this from former IFLA president, Donna Schieder, and she summarized it the best when she eloquently stated that there is no sustainable development without access to information, and there is no meaningful, inclusive access to information without libraries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elvira. Uh, you know, that's, that's a good summary of how libraries have been enabling uh, women and uh, uh, working towards gender equality by providing them skills that they need. And also the skills, not only to uh, uh, excel in their business and small business opportunities and so on, but also participate in democratic processes. That's wonderful. And uh, as uh, you would have seen noted from the slides that I provided uh, earlier on, most of these slides come from SCAP directly uh, uh, from the reports, the profile reports that they've submitted uh, in the last two, two days. So um, uh, I've also uh, provided the source of the data that uh, from where I've taken those uh, you know, tables and figures. Um, and the labor force participation by female uh, participants, uh, you know, other than certain countries like Mongolia, uh, we are lagging behind. So Philippines is not alone. Mm -hmm. But your uh, contribution through libraries is stunning. Thank you, Elvira. Uh, so from the land of the Philippines, we are going to Australia, where uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Patricia Hepworth, who is the Director of Policy Education at the Australian Library and Information Association, is going to discuss how Australia is embedding SDGs in the library practice, which is a very good example of how many countries could uh, um, you know, emulate and replicate. They are reporting, stretching the goals, reporting against a baseline that they had come up with. Uh, uh, and uh, if not all the 17 goals, they are uh, 
looking closely at the goals that the libraries could contribute directly, such as 4.6, 4.7, target 4.6, 4.7, and goal five itself. Thank you, Patricia, for your uh, intervention. Please unmute yourself and uh, speak to us. Thank you, Shadi, and thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, I did want to just start by acknowledging that I am on the lands of the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people, and start by paying my respect to their elders. It's been wonderful to hear everybody's stories about the way that the SDGs are being implemented in the, in the different countries. Um, and as Shadi said, what I really wanted to do today was talk about the way that the libraries in Australia have all come together to really work to put the SDGs into practice and to use the SDGs uh, for strategic policy setting, for strategic direction, and make sure that what that we're doing and the actions that we're taking are actually improving the community in line with those SDGs. And so, Australia obviously has been working along with our IFLA colleagues on the SDGs for a number of years. And in 2019, we gathered together librarians from across the country and across the different sectors. So from school libraries and public libraries, from libraries in hospitals and universities and government, all the different library and information professionals came together. And what we worked through was really identifying which of those of all the goals and libraries contribute to all the goals, but which of them were particularly within our remit? And then for each of those, where were the real strong areas where the work that libraries do will make a substantial difference? And I just wanted to, so one of those goals fairly obviously is um, Sustainable Development Goal 4, and I feel very comfortable in picking that one out because it has already been referenced in all three presentations that have come before me. And as um, Shadi mentioned in his very initial presentation too, the COVID pandemic has had a particular impact on our achievement towards um, the quality education goal. I saw something on the UN site that suggested we've almost gone sort of 20 years backwards thanks to the pandemic in achieving that goal. So it's very key to us. When we looked at quality education, though, what we needed to do in Australia was turn it into something really meaningful. So from that quality education goal, we've actually pulled out four sub-targets and put stretch goals against them. Now, these goals um, pick up different aspects on it. So, for example, to align with Sustainable Development Goal 4.6, which is uh, ensure that all youth and a substantial proportion of adults achieve literacy and numeracy, we thought, well, what can we do with to that? And we realised that it, for us in Australia, that meant making sure that libraries were part of the key policy initiatives in that area. So we need to be part of the early language and literacy strategies because we reach children before anybody else gets to them. We need to be part of the media literacy and the digital literacy because we're on the front lines of helping people who come into our libraries needing help with their technology or struggling with mis and disinformation. When we looked at um, the sub goal 4.7, which was ensuring that learners acquire knowledge and skills needed to in turn promote the sustainable development goals, we actually pulled two sub strategies out of that. One that really looked towards First Nations culture and heritage, which I'll talk about in slightly more detail in just a second. And the other one that looked strongly towards diversity and gender equality. So making sure that our workforce and our collection and our services reflected the diversity of our nation and that anybody, whatever their background, could come into the library and find the resources that they needed. Whether, you know, and that included making sure that we identified key groups such as um, refugees and asylum seekers within our community and making sure we had support. We also, with quality education, pulled out our final target that looked at the libraries themselves. So looking at lifelong learning for librarians and library staff, what is it, and tying also in with 4.7, what is it that our staff need to know, our librarians need to know in order to continue to grow and develop and um, put in place the sustainable development goals. So having sort of pulled out four sub goals, 
for each one of those goals, we then went through and made sure that we mapped a number of different activities. And these activities were either activities we were already doing, but we were extending, or in fact, they were additional and brand new activities. So for example, with our um, cultural competency, looking at our First Nation people, we were already doing work around um, raising awareness for library staff on culturally informed and respectful practice. But we knew that we could extend that by carrying out um, a survey to assess the proportion of people who were, who'd undertaken cultural competency and then benchmarking it and making sure that we increased the number who had done training every year. And we thought, well, there's a new activity in here we can do as well, which says for our professional recognition program, we will actually now make it a requirement that people have, be able to show that they do have that cultural competency in order to attain their, their professional status. So we made sure we had extended actions and new actions. We put in key measures so that we knew whether we had achieved or we hadn't achieved. And then we made sure that we committed to reporting. So we will have a, we do a yearly report and our next one will be out hopefully by the end of the week. And we've um, committed to doing an interim report in 2025 and another one in 2013 or 2030. All of that coming together has been really beneficial. So it means that we've got really concrete action. We've got concrete measures and we've got concrete reporting. And that's really helped too in our reporting to the government. Uh, as Pramila said, Libraries appear often in those voluntary national reviews and being able to have the information ready to go has been very useful for Australian libraries to government because it supports them in their reporting obligation and gives us an opportunity to highlight what we are doing. Um, it also obviously means that we are now all working together to deliver on those goals. And I think I can speak for the Australian library sector in saying that we are really looking forward to continuing to help the libraries join up their individual activities to become part of a wider and bigger purpose of obtaining the SDGs. Thank you, Shadi. Thank you, Trisha. I'm sure you would make available the templates of those reports if uh, any other country would be interested to emulate your example. And, uh, you know, colleagues, uh, the way that Australia as a nation is approaching the SDGs is a remarkable thing. And uh, many countries uh, who would like to uh, replicate their model in uh, uh, creating a baseline reporting, not only in the short term, but also do a, a longitudinal a study over a period of time as to how libraries have been contributing, please reach out to Trish Hepworth, uh, who is available. Thank you, Carly, for uh, Carly Backman is the librarian at the SCAP library here. Thank you for uh, um, providing the URL of the uh, latest report the SCAP has provided on the progress on SDGs. So that takes us to Japan from, uh, you know, we focused on uh, um, the goal number four, five, and uh, Trish also spoke to uh, other goals, uh, particularly eight, uh, where the workforce development is highlighted. Uh, we go to a very important area of inclusion. Earlier, Philippines uh, showed us the example of how to include uh, uh, women in our programming, and uh, Trish pointed to the First Nations people. But Misaka Namura, our board members, of the Chief Secretariat of the Assistive Technology Development Organization in Japan, uh, who coordinates this uh, very interesting project of bringing inclusivity uh, within uh, the society through services provided in libraries, particularly amongst those who are challenged with uh, print disabilities uh, so that they can uh, truly live to the concept of leaving no one behind. Um, and I'm sure uh, you know she would refer to the technological tools and uh, accessibility requirements uh, uh, for the visually uh, challenged people as well. And there was earlier a, a question about Marrakesh Treaty uh, by one of the participants. So Misako Namura, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, please uh, elaborate upon your program in the next four minutes. Thank you. Unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be part of this event 
and uh, the my uh, time only four minutes, so time is limited. And uh, I try to concentrate on what I wanted to say on the role of library to reach the unreached and the person with print and other disabilities in SDGs. So um, the, uh, I like to focus on the, the uh, goal for quality education, especially focus on target 4.6 that promotes universal literacy since the UN is emphasizing that literacy as a key component of the future we want is essential to reach the newly proposed sustainable goal, development goal on promoting inclusive and equitable quality education and lifelong learning for all. To achieve this target, I think libraries play an important role as an information and knowledge provider in the community. See, they can welcome every community members. I mean, I can, we can welcome, accommodate all community members. In order to do so, we have to ensure, maybe libraries, librarians have to ensure to equal access to print materials and libraries like uh, recorded knowledge and the culture for people with leading disabilities. Under the, uh, the SDG concept, leave no one behind. And uh, there are really two initiatives in Japan to ensure access to information and reading materials for everyone. One initiative by volunteer and non-profit organizations and the related ICT industries in producing and providing accessible multimedia textbooks to elementary and junior high school students for free, partly funded by the Ministry of Education in, in Japan. And what is the role of libraries in this project? Public libraries can distribute those accessible, accessible textbooks to target children and the students. So I, I think it's a big role. Uh, of uh, librarians in Japan. Another initiative by the Japan Library Association, library services for person with disability section I and mean, by holding a training to promote inclusive library services in public libraries and ask those library to provide accessible version of mainstream publications based on the so-called Reading Barrier Free Act in 2019, after the, the ratification of Marrakesh Treaty. So maybe you Please, your country, if, if, the, it, if you don't ratify the Malakish Treaty, please ratify it. Then they, you can have a lot of opportunity to promote people with disability or clean to disability, such as dyslexia. Then they, so give opportunities. Please consider about it. And the um, 
So, then the, uh, I think this is the, uh, the two initiatives by Japan, but actually we, we assistive, assistive technology development organization take initiative the the role of uh, the in promoting SDGs, particularly focusing on education. Regarding this, I hope all of you in your countries promote accessible uh, digital information system. In short, DAISY. Have you ever heard of DAISY? Maybe many of you don't know what DAISY is. DAISY is the uh, accessible info information system. Then the uh, established by the uh, people from uh, IFLA sections of LPD, library serving people with print disabilities. So the backed by those people, we start to promote accessible version of print materials, reading materials. So maybe in partnership with your country, we can promote strong tool, I mean a strong ICT tool to uh, achieve education target, I mean a quality uh, education. So I hope you will contact me and uh, discuss with it. And then uh, we, we have a lot of opportunities once again, and, a lot, and then uh, provide a lot of opportunities for people with print disabilities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Ako, for uh, sensitizing us uh, for the need to become a part of the DC Consortium and also ratify the Marrakesh Treaty for all any country as inter happen to have done so. But uh, to, to the true spirit of uh, this uh, um, treaty, as well as uh, the objectives of the consortium, many libraries have been a part of uh, uh, the process. And uh, those who would like to learn more about uh, um, the process, uh, please contact Misako at her email address as she can provide the chat in the chat box. And uh, every library I feel uh, should be a part of uh, this whole movement, providing access to facilities and opportunities and uh, material in the way that uh, it could be accessible to people with disabilities. So from uh, Japan, we now go to New Zealand, where Andy Fenton, the CEO and co-founder of uh, many I ICT companies uh, in New Zealand is joining us. Uh, uh, today he's going to, although he wears uh, many hats, he's going to speak to us uh, uh, featuring a special partnership in New Zealand, the Libraries Partnership Program in New Zealand uh, that has given birth to this Klutha District Libraries uh, DigiHub. Um, so, he may also discuss as to how libraries could be a part of the digital transformation strategy within one's own nation. Uh, and Andy, over to you. Please unmute yourself and speak to us. Hello everyone, my name's Andy Fenton. I'm a New Zealander who works closely with the library and cultural heritage sector throughout our country. I get to see firsthand how partnerships between libraries and other sectors can further support economic and social development of communities, particularly focusing on goals 4, 5, 16 and 17. In 2020, during the initial COVID lockdowns, New Zealand's Librarians Professional Association, Lianza, reported a surge in online memberships and e-lending at public libraries throughout New Zealand.
This is consistent with international evidence of usage of public libraries increasing during times of recession. For libraries, the concern was also the cutting of services alongside long-term loss of jobs and library expertise at the very time a greater demand for services could be expected by those impacted. The New Zealand Libraries Partnership Program was developed to help address these concerns, also to support and protect libraries in their role in helping communities during the recovery from the pandemic and beyond. Our government listened to the sector advocacy and entrusted our National Library to lead and support this recovery across New Zealand's library sector, especially in public libraries with a funding package of 58.8 million New Zealand dollars. The focus of the NZLPP work has brought the sector together, helped strengthen cross-sector relationships and triggered diverse collaborations within and beyond the library sector. But what about the local level? That's New Zealand on the bottom right corner of the map. We're about the same size roughly as the British Isles or Japan and obviously a lot smaller in terms of population uh, with just 5 million in New Zealand. The bottom right corner or southeast corner of New Zealand below Dunedin is the Clutha District. Clutha District Libraries recently established a DigiHub funded by the NZLPP in the hopes of creating a district-wide cultural heritage repository that facilitates the collection of Clutha's stories. Clutha District Libraries does not have the resources or space to develop a comprehensive physical archive. The DigiHub concept was developed with the goal to help libraries promote community engagement and better connect them to their stakeholders via an online archive instead. A DigiHub is a space where both librarians and the public have access to digitization equipment, computers, cameras, scanners, training manuals, workflow, etc. And it results in an increase in digital literacy and upskilling across library employees as well as individuals in the community. Education, or SDG4, is supported by literacy, which is supported by library services, of course. It also preserves historical material that will be of significant benefit to New Zealanders and other world citizens for generations to come. This approach opens up new service avenues for Clutha District Libraries. For example, librarians can better assist local schools and students to research New Zealand history from a local and evidence-based viewpoint, a topic, a topic that is set to become part of the New Zealand schools curriculum, a direct contribution towards goals 4, 16 and 17. Clutha District Libraries also implemented their own cloud-based site, Clutha Heritage, to securely upload and share the content they are creating. This Recollect platform actively encourages community engagement and it even has the option to build online narratives or exhibitions along with tagging and crowdsourcing. Free access to Clutha's local history has grown with this initiative, which is one of IFLA's values and touched on by Keynote Pramila today. Libraries perform an essential role by facilitating inclusive access to content. Participation in local and national government by informed and literate citizens strengthens democracy. When people connect to their history, they feel a sense of belonging, that they are part of something bigger than themselves. The Clutha Heritage Project is funded by the National Library Partnership Programme until June this year, but the library has just learned that this will now be extended by its own district council, given the positive feedback from the community. For me, this resonates with IFLA's message regarding powering sustainable development, and as that communique also notes, present in almost every city and town around the world, library networks like Clutha District offer unique reach and potential to achieve policy goals across the board, in particular those set out in the United Nations 2030 Agenda. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andy, for spelling out how libraries can at a very local level contribute to sustainable development. Uh, yes especially in uh, preserving the cultural heritage of uh, every district, every village, every barangay, every province uh, uh, in, in the Asia Pacific uh, and world at large. And you also touched upon uh, uh, the, the role of libraries in uh, not only preserving the local heritage and culture, but uh, through which uh, contributing to the national image, which is, which is very important. Thank you. Thank you for uh, going deeper into this 
particular project. And thank you, Ms. Patmavadi Krishnan, for testifying that uh, as, a, as a wheelchair user, you were not hindered uh, when you were using the libraries in uh, uh, Malaysia. And if you are interested in uh, you know, joining and contributing and involving in IFLA, please feel free to do so and also connect up with uh, our colleagues uh, who are passionately working in the area of uh, services to persons uh, with uh, disabilities and uh, different uh, abilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we move on now to the last speaker of the day before we open up uh, a, very, a good uh, 40 minutes, uh, at least 30, 35 minutes of discussions and interventions by the participants. And uh, this is uh, Singapore, where uh, Ms. Joan B., the university librarian of the Singapore Institute of Technology, is uh, going to speak to us uh, about uh, quite a few initiatives. But what is uh, very particular about her uh, presentation is uh, the fact that uh, librarians are able to actually involve themselves in curriculum development, uh, designing of uh, adult pedagogy, which would uh, enable the Singapore future workforce to acquire the 21st century skills that they need to survive. And uh, you know, quite often we look up to countries like Singapore, where they've not only progressed in uh, providing ICT and broadband access, um, they've also started to think about uh, the future of their citizens by uh, imparting critical thinking and digital literacy at, the, at a very early level of uh, people's education. And uh, I believe that Ms. V would also speak to us about uh, the National Library Board's uh, contribution to schools and learners program and uh, the Polytechnic Library's Polymal and Digital Life program. Thank you, Ms. V, for uh, being so patient uh, um, to have the last word of uh, this uh, intervention. Over to you, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shady, for the introduction. A very good afternoon to all the participants that are here. Uh, I'm, I feel very honored and very happy to be attending these uh, sessions with everyone and to share what we have done in Singapore. So uh, my focus will actually be on SDG for education, uh, a little bit on the target one, uh, embedding in national strategies and target uh, nine on the lifelong learning. Uh, so the disruption caused by the pandemic over the last two years uh, have highlighted certain gaps, but it also gives us the opportunities for libraries. There are disruptions to education, learning, business, uh, jobs, and the business uh, processes. But it also means it is more critical that people and even children need to understand their digital rights and how their data is being collected and used and about in misinformation. So the Singapore libraries have actually taken the national uh, call to imbue uh, IDL, information, digital literacy and critical thinking skills to the schools. I'm going to share a few initiatives here uh, like what uh, Everett and Trish and the other uh, speakers have shared. Uh, these are not new initiatives that the libraries have to been um, involved and embarking. And it's the same cases for us. It has been for a couple of years. But then COVID-19 really has accelerated the implementation and widened its outreach because national policies are in place, national drive from agencies, uh, ministries, there is a resource being catered for it, and then there is directive from the national level, and that really helps to move things a lot. So uh, I want to share also about how the National Library Board has played a role uh, in terms of schools, because they have this SURE campaign, uh, SURE, S-U-R-E, meaning uh, SURE Understand Research Evaluate campaign for schools, developed by them which started in 2013, it has been way back, but I, I think it has accelerated and make it even more uh, embedded before the schools in Singapore. 
to impart uh, IDL and critical thinking skills through programs for students and teaching resources for educators. And when they say educators, it means teachers and parents. And just uh, last year, I think end of last year or early this year, NLB has also recently launched an online learning resource platform to provide free learning resources uh, in conjunction with one of the national uh, polytechnic, uh, Nanyang Polytechnic, and they co-develop learning resources focusing uh, areas uh, like in digital career sustainability issues and, and many more. Um, of course, the Polytechnic Libraries, um, I thought I should just give a brief definition about Polytechnic in Singapore. We refer to institute that focus on delivering technical education at a diploma level. The Poly Libraries have also come together to harmonize their learning services under a one-stop framework of digital life at Poly's. So they do have a lot of push from the agency in uh, Singapore. And this framework is very forward looking and it houses all the baseline competencies uh, rolled down by the various government bodies in Singapore. Uh, and there's also this information uh, literacy interest group under the Singapore Council of Chief Librarians, uh, CCL, uh, IL for short, that uh, involves the National Library Board, the Polytechnic Libraries and the University Libraries to take an integrated approach, uh, like what Shady had shared earlier in his opening, uh, in building the ideal and critical skills for Singaporeans. So other than working together to resource share in IDL teaching materials, there's also a concerted effort and we are still working on it. Uh, it's not an easy path to be on to streamline and scaffold the IDL and critical skills for a learner who is through the local Singapore education system from primary school up to the university day. But definitely because of the IDL teaching materials sharing, when we get into the lockdown during circuit breaker in Singapore, where all the things have to move online, where learning has to be moved online, it helps the individual libraries a lot to quickly get resources up to support our users. Uh, from an institute of higher learning view, since I'm from the university, I also witnessed, witnessed the quick push towards digitized learning and upgrading, specifically for adult learners whose jobs got disrupted where it also means the ur uh, urgency for IHL, like Singapore Institute of Technology, SIT, where I'm from, will need to adapt and transform our education system to put in place uh, this multiple upgrading pathways so that Singaporeans can choose the pathway that best fits their individual aspirations and needs. Uh, what I mean by this uh, variegated educational pathway, it means that learners are uh, engage in the hybrid mode of learning is a mixture of on-site and online. They take uh, specific learning modules at point of need for their work uh, or in the need for their life across different IHLs with the potential to step into a degree or a certification. Uh, these learners will come in at different uh, learning levels. Uh, so someone who has uh, attended the schools in the 80s will have very different learning habits from a student who is currently studying in the school now and who learns things you know that are in digital format uh, who use immersive technologies like AR VR for their learning especially in this uh, post pandemic period so how do we make sure that access to resources is similar for learners with such varied digital skills and comfort how can we work closely with other libraries like NLB and Polytechnics libraries to set the IDL skills baseline to scaffold readiness for the citizens, Singapore citizens, and how do we get library staff to be comfortable to provide services and assistance in this new mode of learning and uh, with different varied learners. So for SIT library, it is not about the change in the types of resources we need to acquire for learning. So, for example, last year, we started to really look at uh, micro learning content, AR, VR content as part of the learning. So there are implications in terms of the, uh, the user digital competency, what, what we need to teach them in order for them to access them properly. Uh, copyright, user's license for such new content, the mode of access for learning is uh, different. 
we also need to transform our business process and service model to the change needs and expectations in accessing information and learning. So the digitization movement has also magnified the importance of interdisciplinary learning and the need to acquire transferable skills in IHL. So there's a big push from our Ministry of Education to, to all the university and the polytechnics towards uh, building in our curriculum that we need to put in the transferable skills. And this uh, actually becomes an opportunity, opportunities for libraries. So uh, in the case of SIT, we have recently developed a industry ready skills framework for the students, IRSF for short, to guide the holistic development of our students in becoming independent lifelong learners who take ownership of their learning journeys and career. And this framework is aligned with the Ministry of Education's 21st century competency uh, and this skills future, which is for our lifelong learners, critical core transferable skills. And because the transferable skills uh, that is put in there has components of the IDL, it really creates the opportunities for SIT library to be part of the curriculum of the university where we design our IDL programs and other ad hoc library programs to formalize and to show how students can acquire certain transferable skills, uh, competency, and apply them through formal and informal curriculum. So I think that is really uh, an opportunity where library uh, can sit to really um, as a bit our embedment in the different uh, programs. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's my sharing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joan. Thank you for highlighting the need for preparing the future generation with transferable skills, the 21st century skills, and the skills that they need to excel in the digitalized world that we are witnessing tomorrow. And uh, you know, no other uh, you know, country could do better than Singapore as uh, you embark upon uh, um, the whole uh, benefits of uh, information communication technologies, which is uh, now becoming more of a, a convergence of uh, the physical spaces, digital spaces, and the biological spaces, which are the, the foundations of uh, IR 4.0. And uh, we see the same trend in Korea and many other countries. Thank you so much for uh, highlighting the role of libraries. We have uh, a few more minutes to go. We would open up uh, for discussions. If uh, people would like to, um, you know, make a comment or raise a question, uh, pay, please feel free to do so. Uh, there was a comment uh, with regard to the heritage project that Andy was referring to as to how this was going to become a, a part of a, a school curriculum. So if you want to elaborate on that uh, for a minute, Andy, before we see if there are any other questions or comments uh, from the audience. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Andy. I pushed the wrong button, sorry, folks. Um, believe it or not, uh, New Zealand history um, was not mandatory to be taught in New Zealand schools until this month, or maybe last month, uh, February. It's a staggering indictment on us. We're only uh, a country that's, I guess, um, we've been settled for 800 years um, and we had a constitution in 1840 um, and it's a crying shame and uh, I think we've woken up and I think some of the initiatives that IFLA have been pushing uh, around um, the, um, the equal access to information as a human right um, and yet we're learning about battles in Europe um, more than we're learning about what went on in our own country in the last thousand years is staggering so um there's a big push for libraries to get behind making their local content because it's one thing to know the national story and they're the big events that are often told in museums but it's another thing to tell the local stories about the businesses that were around 125 years ago and are part of the fabric of your society today because their descendants or their influence is still in your landscape or your purview and you don't have to be a local to enjoy that you can still be someone on the other side of the world with a connection to that place thank you andy and uh, you know uh, there are 
quite a few of those uh, types of uh, initiatives around uh, led by librarians and we have uh, uh, from this very land, uh, Professor Nam Tip with us, uh, who is also leading a Memory of the World project uh, for, for uh, Thailand. And we also know that uh, UNESCO has a huge program uh, that, that uh, it's steering around, uh, around the world. So are there any comments, any questions from the audience? Uh, that, uh, I have a question on the information society, especially the digital divide. Uh, because you uh, you guys always mention about the digital literacy. So when the digital divide happening to the school student, because not every school student can adapt the digital literacy uh, during the uh, post-information era. So uh, what is the future trend to uh, care about the digital uh, divide when the students are not available to learn the digital skill when digital skill is necessary for them. Thank you. Would you want to identify yourself, uh, Ms. Hong Kong? Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Hong Kong, and uh, digital literacy is also concerned in Hong Kong and uh, developed with the STEAM education. So I agree uh, all of you talking about the quality education. And I think that digital literacy is a concern, especially the ethical, for example, the infodemic is very serious uh, in nowadays, especially the politic concern. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think I would pass this question on to Joan, uh, who has uh, um, an experience of uh, uh, using library services to promote digital literacy and also STEM education uh, among uh, um, girls uh, and in Tibet, uh, in bridging many debates. Uh, so would you want to respond to that, uh, John? Um, definitely, uh, even in Singapore, there's still much more work uh, to be done. Uh, there have been policies in place. And I think because of uh, the disruptions and new changes, uh, the Ministry of Education has also come out with uh, information digital literacy competency that is compulsory to be inbuilt across the schools from primary school, secondary schools to university. And that really drives the behavior and the involvement of libraries. But we also have fellow library colleagues who struggle that their institution might not have acknowledged that as a role in the library and has uh, get, get some other divisions to be fulfilling that role or they they feel that just watching a YouTube video or something will have suffix. So uh, there are still gaps and uh, struggles. I think uh, the National Library Board uh, plays a very important role uh, and they really provide a lot of resources out there to freely for educators and parents. So the awareness needs to be, to be there. And, and we recently noticed NLB uses YouTube to promote their resources for their share campaign also. So I think they're trying to expand the outreach because parents is also an important educators for the digital uh, divide. Thank you. I think uh, that, that's, that's a good answer. And, uh, you know, we have the email address, uh, address of that person who posted the question. So those who want to respond to this question, uh, please, uh, you know, feel free to write to uh, Ms. Hawk Khan Ao because there are three stages to the whole process uh, in the digitalization era. Uh, there is a need for identification of new competencies and qualifications, uh, uh, which could be in the second stage embedded into curriculum, which we call the integration stage of uh, integrating the new competencies uh, in uh, the curriculum process, right from early childhood to tertiary education. But there is also this uh, whole process of implementation of those through the delivery institutions, be it online delivery, blended delivery, or you know, fully face-to-face uh, -face delivery like we do have in schools. So this process needs to be taken very seriously by the uh, various governments uh, that uh, have the remit uh, to promote uh, uh, di digital literacy uh, in uh, their education system not only in the academic system, but also in the TVET and uh, non-formal education systems. So there is a whole range of literature available, but um, you know, thank you, Joan, for highlighting how the National Library Board has been involved in this process. 
So I saw a hand up by a person from Malaysia who has been very actively commenting, Mr. Kavin Kavindra Pulanathan. Right, right. right. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Kavin Thren, a blind disabled from Malaysia who is a very active lifelong learner. And I, I would like to make some short but meaningful points here. Uh, the first one is I think uh, IFLA should have a very, very great uh, engagements and meaningful partnerships with uh, many um, open uh, active library activism, such as the Internet Archive and Open Library, which uh, and also uh, Wikimedia, which, which are, you know, uh, formed by common people across the digital world. Um, for example, Wikimedia have this project called Kivix, where they address digital divide by providing offline Wikipedias to many, many remote parts of the world where internet access is a dream. And, and, and also open library have been uh, recently sued by uh, you know, conglomeration of companies uh, to, to suppress the access of books. Uh, you know, and, and things like that. I think um, also IFLA should have a very active, not only voice, but participation in this kind of library injustice, where, for example, Alexander Albakian, an ac library activist and also digital activist who single-handedly allow access to scientific papers are being sued across the world and India recently uh, is running the case. I think IFLA as a voice of library and should also protect and, and engage engage with this kind of uh, digital activism and, and allow for a fairer digital world. And, and, and lastly, I would like to say that uh, they are also a surge and, uh, uh, and a greater access to MOOC, which is the massive open online course platform during the pandemic. I, I do think that uh, uh, this MOOC uh, initiatives through uh, Coursera, EDX and, and Class Central which, which unites all of them should be also engaged uh, with IFLA to have a more, uh, you know, SDG based uh, development. And let me end my uh, my 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 uh, journey here by, by asking question to John B, the, the Singapore uh, Library, and um, how does uh, the um, National Library have meaningful uh, access to IDL uh, for the disabled, um, especially print disabled? Thank you. Thank you, thank this, you, John. Do you want to take it up? Yeah, unfortunately, because I'm not really from the National Library uh, Board, I'm from the Singapore Institute of Technology. But when I visit the, the public uh, libraries, definitely I understand there have been facilities uh, built in to help with the disabled, be, be it wheelchair accessibility or the, a reading machine for people who uh, might have uh, uh, eyesight uh, issues. Um, but how extensively it is done across all the libraries, uh, I'm not able to, <laughs> to answer that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pulantaran for uh, highlighting the need for IFLA to be engaged uh, and IFLA member associations to be engaged with uh, uh, micro-credentialing organizations such as Coursera, UDX, Class Central, and others. Uh, you know, the example uh, Pramila earlier highlighted was uh, a partnership with uh, Udemy, Google, and uh, Coursera, through which they were able to spread uh, skills during the pandemic to a number of people, including a lot of people with uh, uh, disabilities, uh, particularly visually impaired as well. And there were a couple of examples that uh, she could uh, um, you know, talk to you, uh, you know, in the side conversation about. And, uh, you know, thank you also for uh, highlighting the need for engaging with Wikimedia and uh, other digital activism uh, uh, initiatives, uh, which, uh, which are happening at, uh, at, a, at a level at uh, IFLA. But what would be beneficial is, uh, uh, you know, in addition to the headquarters engagement uh, of IFLA, if the national associations and member uh, organizations are also able to directly uh, contribute and uh, converse with uh, these, uh, these uh, efforts, that would be very, very helpful. Um, sir, Any I'm, other... I'm yeah, sir, I'm, I'm very sorry. This is Kevin again. But briefly, I know this is kind of hard, but can you... Uh, do you think you can make any comments about this, uh, you know, 
um, library injustice where you know internet archive and sci hub is being actively sued by big conglomerates and what do you think sustainable library discussion may 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 provide yeah well that's that's a question at this point in time we may not be able to immediately respond to because uh, you know ifla as a as an organization that represents a large number of uh, organizations in 190 countries would need to uh, come to a position uh, when it comes to place play, play, placing its uh, its arguments but that said uh, um, you know we'll we'll uh, note it and uh, pass it on to our uh, colleagues who are in uh, advocacy domain at the headquarters but all but it's a point to think about I, I'm, I'm sure that you know many of us would want to respond to it but in a very informed and concerted manner but thank you for raising it mr Pulantara. okay so we have six more minutes to go uh, um, can i just comment on yes. the yeah, uh, even we have that issue, uh, Coursera, Udemy, and uh, Google, those uh, platforms uh, do not cater for uh, visually impaired and differently abled people. So temp what, how we have uh, addressed that issue is we have a strong partnership with one of the private universities in Sri Lanka, Slit University, and they have a program for partially uh, uh, visible people. Uh, so we have identified learners from that program and they have a not visually impaired people learner with that. So we couple with the uh, just a normal person with the visually impaired person. That is how at the moment we have addressed with that partnership. Uh, so it is the partnership and you can't expect uh, right now from Coursera or other learning that we can communicate it to them, but at the moment they, it is not possible. So partnership is very important here. Uh, in addition to have some sort of national uh, policy on these things. So just Thank to you. give Thank an idea how we have addressed that. Thank you, Pramila. I think uh, it's an important point. And ma many of these uh, um, e-learning providers uh, are yet to uh, embed, uh, you know, inclusive uh, principles in their uh, platforms. But that said, if you ask them, if you ask Udemy or Coursera or uh, EDX or anyone for that matter, they would say that uh, there are certain steps that they undertake and uh, it's early days. Uh, I'm sure they would uh, move into that direction. Uh, Winston, did you want to respond to the question that uh, Mr. Pulantran um, mentioned? Although I mentioned to him that uh, we would uh, pass this on to the headquarters, but you may have a perspective. Um, I don't want to respond specifically to that question because time is running out and I can't possibly address the question fairly and honestly in all details. But what I wanted to say is the, the debate on many of these professional issues could occupy us for hours yet. What I suggest your questioner could do is contact me as the chair of the regional division offline You've got my email in the chat. Um, you could also uh, address questions to Misako, who is a member of the Regional Division Committee, and she's concerned with um, services for people with disability. Uh, Pramila also, uh, and many of us uh, in this session are members of the Division Committee. But the question is, IFLA addresses all these questions all the time. IFLA has 50 different professional sections on uh, particular dealing with specific issues of information access. Uh, I think the best thing to do is, to, is for your uh, questioner to look at the IFLA website, see which sections are, seem to be most relevant to his, uh, her line of inquiry, and then look at the... Um, names of the leaders of those sections and send them questions directly by email. That is the, the most sort of high level way of dealing with that effic efficiently. And, Thank you, Winston, you know, for that. 
But I mainly just wanted to go on to the... say, Sh Shelley, sorry, just want to go on to say that anybody in the session who isn't already a member of IFLA um, is welcome to join IFLA and engage in these discussions um, afterwards. You know, um, you don't have to be a, a member to engage in these discussions, but we'd like you to join with us. Um, it's a good organization to join. It's a, an organization for the information sector broadly. So um, I encourage you to um, join us. Simple. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Winston. There are quite a few, as Winston mentioned, there are quite a few professional committees and uh, uh, sections within IFLA. And you don't have to be a paid member to join these. So if you're interested in the issues that are uh, deliberated upon, uh, and these uh, sections and uh, committees are very professional in their uh, operation. They come up with their annual plans. They pursue certain uh, uh, ideas, certain projects. Uh, they collaborate with uh, uh, multi-stakeholders. So anybody who is not uh, engaged with IFLA would like to engage uh, deeper, please feel free to do so. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, we are right on time. Uh, we need to conclude uh, our meeting. We have probably gone ahead uh, 15 minutes over the time. So if there are no other questions, uh, I would like to, um, you know, hand it over to Winston for a formal word of thanks. Uh, but before that, uh, would uh, Carly Bachman, who has hosted us, would you want to say anything, uh, Carly? Hi, thank you. And thank you so much. I always get so excited when IFLA or other library associations come and join us at our bigger UN meetings. It's, um, I feel from the, I've been in with the UN now for over around 15 years and the lack of library presence um, in all of our larger, more policy-oriented conversations and discussions has been sort of one of the great disappointments of my professional career as I'm a practicing librarian trying to, you know, fulfill my duties in meeting the research needs of the staff here. But meanwhile, my heart is longing for there to be a much stronger presence. So I feel like it's in, going in the right direction. The This regional um, organization of IFLA has definitely increased the visibility um, at APFSD in the last few years dramatically, and it's super exciting to see, and I'm so glad that you're back. So um, very happy to be able to kind of in an ad hoc way get to meet with Pramila and Shadi today informally, and the presentations were inspiring and wonderful and keep me inspired to keep doing the work here. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, Winston, over to you. Yes, thank you, Chaddy. Um, okay, time is up, so I'll be very brief. I would like to just um, respond to what Carly just said uh, and inform her and inform everybody that the new regional structure of IFLA, which was inaugurated last year, is giving the Asia Pacific region, like all the other regions, a much stronger voice in IFLA and it has given us a role of advocacy to uh, in international partners for um, you know, strengthening the library profession, the information profession together, working together to strengthen the profession. Because uh, we've already quoted um, a former president, Don Ashida, who said that you know, information is the key. Information is the key to everything, to education, to development, and the, um, the combined forces of the chairs of the, all the region, regional committees of IFLA, um, I'm, I'm just one of six, and we, we six chairs of the regional committees make up the new regional council of IFLA. And the council has decided, or has been you know, talking with the IFLA president, and we have decided collectively that our top level goal uh, for the whole of the Council of IFLA is to work for the SDGs. Now, obviously, that um, divides up into a whole lot of uh, tasks and, and you know, um, activities and action plans and so on. But the top level goal is to promote the role of libraries in working for the SDGs. So that is a big message, Carly, that I would like you to pass to your colleagues at ESCAP. Okay. 
Thank you. Now, I would again like to thank all of you for coming to this session, to particularly thank our speakers, all our six and seven speakers, uh, particularly uh, Pramila, the keynote speaker, Shadi, the MC, and um, Joan and Chris and Andy and Elvira, and who, who else is in here hiding? I can't see the names. Um, all of the speakers, um, your presentations have been recorded. We will take notes. We will report back to IFLA headquarters, and we will make sure that many of the good ideas that came out of the session will be picked up and circulated to um, management of IFLA. So once again, um, this has been a regional session. I hope you will inform your colleagues in the region uh, what IFLA is doing in the region. If the, your colleagues in the library sector are not already members of IFLA, persuade them to join us because uh, you know we want to strengthen the profession. So um, with that, sorry, my telephone's just rang. <laughs> um, with that final word, I again, thank you for attending and I hope you had an enjoyable session. Thank you, bye. <laughs>